is now being recorded. Good morning. Um, if anyone can just open with a word of prayer, please. Father God, we thank you for so much for this morning, Lord. We come before you in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, as we are here to learn from your word, my Father God, help us, teach us and guide us, my Father God. We thank you so much for this day, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah, so we have covered two chapters from the Gospel of John. We are getting into the third chapter. Um, chapter three, because it's a very favorite, we'll, we'll give it little special status. We will cover only this one chapter today, but otherwise we'll always try to cover two chapters without fail so that we can finish the portion. But because John chapter three has got a lot of important doctrine in it, um, maybe we can you know, focus on it in greater detail. So um, if we could have uh, someone read out the very familiar story of John chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, uh, once that story is read out, uh, maybe we will look at the details. Uh, so John 3, verses 1 to 10, if anyone could read out. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with you. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is a spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the uh, say, sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit? Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Yes. So let's look at some of the details which were mentioned in this uh, familiar story. It starts off by saying, now there was a Pharisee. So we get to know that this is not just a, a lay person. This is someone who will know his Old Testament very, very well. In fact, he would have memorized large portions of the entire Old Testament. So here is a man who's highly knowledgeable about what is written in the Old Testament scriptures. And moreover, he's somebody in political authority and power because it says that he is a member of the Jewish ruling council. Uh, the Jewish people were given certain rights and privileges by the Romans. The Romans, of course, were the final authority, uh, but at least some local uh, political privileges would be given to local bodies. So Nicodemus is part of that ruling council. And he comes to Jesus at night. At this time, uh, this is still the beginning stages of Jesus' ministry. So the opposition against Jesus has not yet started. So he doesn't come at night because he's scared uh, about the opposition that Jesus is facing. Rather, maybe he comes at night because he wants to first clarify his doubts before he publicly begins to associate with Jesus. You know, he's somebody who is well known. People know him. People look up to him. Um, and he's a member of the Jewish ruling council. So it would be good if he can first find out whether this Jesus is really trustworthy or not, and then publicly acknowledge him in front of people. So maybe that is the reason why he comes to Jesus at night. Because right now at this stage, Jesus is not facing any opposition from the Pharisees or from anyone else at the moment. Uh, this uh, this uh, no open um, 
you know attack against jesus yes the the some of the religious people are unhappy with the things which he is saying there is some mumbling and grumbling going on but no open uh, attacks or conspiracies or plans to harm jesus as yet so he comes at night and these are the words which he speaks he calls him rabbi uh, you know a respectful way of addressing him as teacher so he says rabbi we know that you are a teacher who has come from god so he addresses jesus as a teacher he does not yet look at him as messiah he only regards him as someone who is a very wise and good teacher who can teach valuable things so he just says we know that you are a teacher who has come from god for no one could perform the signs you are doing if god were not with him so um he says we know that you are god focused god centered uh, you are a good teacher um now there's one uh, remark that he makes over here no one could perform the signs you are doing if god were not with him does this mean that those who are not of god they cannot perform any signs can those who are against god can they perform signs is that possible it is possible um because it fa in fact it talks about how uh, satan himself sometimes comes as a angel of light to deceive so how can we really know whether a person who is performing signs and wonders is of god or against god um it's quite simple uh, because in matthew uh, 7 verses 18 to 20 jesus is talking about uh, good fruit and bad fruit and he says by their fruit you will recognize them so yes in fact if someone could read out that matthew 7 uh, verses 18 to 20 if someone could read out matthew 7 18 to 20 <clears throat> matthew 7 18 to 20 a good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire therefore by their fruits you will know them we cannot probably um assess a person based on the signs and wonders they perform because there are people who may be able to perform signs and wonders but their heart may be very far away from god but one way to very clearly get an idea of what they are like is from their fruit what is coming out of their life on a daily basis their conduct the way they treat people the way they behave uh, the words which come out of their mouth these give a very clear picture of what that person actually is like on the inside whether inside their heart whether they are for god or not um so which is why you know in second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 it talks about uh, satan um uh, and the lawless one and it talks about this antichrist over there in second thessalonians 2 9 and it says he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie so yes even the evil can perform signs and wonders if satan is uh, you know enabling them and helping them to do that uh but the fruit from their lives will automatically show us whether the person is genuinely from god or not jesus was not uh, one of those preachers and teachers of our modern day you know the only time we ever see a preacher or teacher nowadays is when he climbs onto the stage who knows what he does in his personal time who knows how he treats his family members uh, who knows whether he spends time in god's presence does he have a repentant heart or not i mean we barely know anything about teachers and preachers today but back then jesus literally had disciples and followers coming and staying with him in his house so and he would go and stay in different people's houses so it was very easy to recognize his fruit how does he talk what are his thoughts what are his choices and priorities so that would clearly show to people whether he is from god or not 
so which is why nicodemus having you know heard about these things about jesus he says we know that you are from god so it's not just the miracles and wonders his very lifestyle shows that he is from god and so indirectly you know um um nicodemus has come over there to find out whether this good teacher is just a teacher or whether he's really the messiah because jesus is saying things and it's making him wonder it's making him wonder whether this jesus is more than just a teacher maybe he is the one that they have been waiting for all the time from old testament times so he basically wants to know that so he's saying nice things but in his heart he's thinking something else he has a big question in his mind and so rather than just address his uh, words outward words jesus directly goes to the heart of the matter jesus knows that in his heart he's actually wondering and thinking is this the messiah that we have been waiting for and so jesus very directly says to him very truly i tell you you know so um uh, in um, biblical times uh, when these uh, records were written down uh, they did not have bold they did not have you know yellow highlighting they did not have all the facilities italics underlining we didn't have all these things in their written records so they would use phrases like this wherever jesus uses this word very truly i tell you it's basically like as if it's in bold and highlighted in yellow so he's making some he's making a very important statement so sit up pay attention and listen to what jesus is going to say next okay so it's wordings like this they indicate that what is about to be said is highlighted in yellow and bold and underlined so this is what jesus is now telling to nicodemus he says very truly i tell you no one can see the kingdom of god unless they are born again so jesus knows that this good man nicodemus nicodemus is a good man you know a godly man he will, he loves godly things and he's been eagerly waiting for it for the day when the messiah will come and so jesus says to him yes in your heart you're eagerly waiting for this and in fact you're wondering whether i am that messiah but are you even ready to see this kingdom will you even enter inside because only those who are born again can enter others cannot even enter so are you at least qualified are you prepared to even see this kingdom that you know so that you've been so eagerly waiting for and the word that jesus use over, uses over there the greek word which is there um it is the word anothen no one can see the kingdom of god unless they are born anothen that greek word anothen can be translated in two ways it can be translated as again or it can be translated from above two very different meanings that greek same greek word anothen it can be used to talk about again or it can be used to talk about from above how does nicodemus understand that word he thinks that jesus is saying you should be born again which is why in the next sentence he says how can someone be born when they are old nicodemus asked surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born so he is understanding anothen in the sense of again but actually jesus is not using anothen in that sense jesus is talking about being born from above so that is where the confusion starts from this point on there's a little confusion in the conversation because jesus is saying one thing nicodemus is thinking something else so when jesus says you cannot even see the kingdom unless you are born anothen jesus is saying you need to be born from above only then you can even think about seeing the kingdom but nicodemus understands anothen differently and he thinks that jesus is saying you should be born again a second time and so he says it's impossible you can't get back into your mother's womb and be born a second time and then in verse 5 see Uh, look at the way you know the holy spirit has inspired john to write down these things 
in sentence one itself john could have just clarified you know the whole uh, issue so that you know it becomes very very clear to the reader but john is building suspense nicodemus is understood one way but jesus is actually saying another way so actually the, for the reader who's reading it it actually builds a, it's a, it, it builds a little bit of suspense and there's a little bit of confusion and people are wondering why is nicodemus saying this while jesus is saying that you know so um in many places in the gospels and in the epistles god inspired the writer to write down things in a particular way to catch the attention of people to make them think hmm what is being said over here okay so we need to watch out for things like that so here we see that actually happening so jesus said you need to be born from above but poor nicodemus is thinking you should be born again and is wondering how on earth an old man can get back into his mother's womb and be born again so in the next sentence um the clarification is still not given uh, so in verse 5 jesus answered very truly you know again that same highlighted bold phrase very truly i tell you no one can enter the kingdom of god unless they are born of water and the spirit in other words they should be born from above only if you're born from above uh that is if you're born of water and the spirit only then can you enter the kingdom of god and then jesus explains in verse 6 because you see flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit you nicodemus have only been born in the flesh your mother gave birth to you so you have been born the same way all human beings are born you have been born in the flesh but you have never been born in the spirit that has not happened to you as yet and uh, uh, so that is not something which nicodemus and the pharisees had understood this is a new thing which god is telling them which jesus is bringing to their notice because in their minds they were thinking that they are all children of the living god um and their belief is based on this uh, deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 1 to 6 So, in fact, if you were to turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter thirty, verses one to six, you will see that over there Moses is talking to the people of Israel, and he's placing the blessings and the curses in front of them, and he's explaining and saying, you know, if you follow what the Lord is telling, all these blessings will come upon you. On the other hand, if you do not follow what God is saying, the curses will come upon you. So basically, in Deuteronomy chapter thirty, verses one to six, Moses basically places these two options in front of the people, and then he says to them, "A day is coming when you people will not follow what God is saying, and when that happens, all these curses which I have told you about, they will come upon you. These bad things will happen to you. However, don't be discouraged because you know the Lord will lo- loves you." and he will bring you back so in deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 3 this is what uh, moses tells them he says the lord your god will bring you back from captivity so moses says yes you people will break the laws of god yes you will be taken away as slaves but don't worry one day the lord who loves you he will bring you back from captivity and then there's another promise which god uh, which moses makes about god in the in this passage that would be in verse 6 he over there moses says and the lord your god will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants so the people are um, um, have always held on to these promises they believe that you know uh, i mean they actually saw with their own eyes that they were brought back from captivity from babylon they saw that happening they also um, you know uh, are waiting for the messiah to come back um, it says in uh, verse 4 and from there he will bring you uh, he the he will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed that would be verse 5 um, and then it says he will prosper you and multiply you so in their minds two things which god promised have have already happened they have been brought back from captivity and they, in their minds they are thinking that god has already circumcised their hearts and so now 
only one thing is left for the messiah to come back literally physically and restore the kingdom so now jesus is trying to bring this new idea into nicodemus mind and tell him you people understood this wrongly yes part 1 has happened you have been brought back from captivity but part 2 has not yet taken place your hearts have not yet been circumcised simply because you have been you only been born in the flesh you have not yet been birthed in the spirit that that part has not yet happened so that is why jesus emphasizes and he says no one can enter the kingdom of god unless they are born of water and the spirit and that part has not yet happened to you is what uh, you know the lord is trying to convey to uh, nicodemus um so now nicodemus finally begins to understand that jesus is not talking about being born again a second time jesus is talking about being born from above born of water and the spirit so now he's thinking oh my goodness how is this going to happen how is this going to take place so he's looking puzzled and then jesus goes on to say in verse 7 you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again the wind blows where wherever it pleases you hear its sound but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going so it is with everyone born of the spirit nicodemus you're trying to figure out in your head how does a person get birthed in the spirit you're trying to figure it out but don't worry it's not that complicated think about the wind i mean you know everyone is very familiar with the wind right um when it comes you can hear it you can feel it you may not understand how it has come from where it has come where it is going you know what are the um, the physical uh, factors which have caused this to happen you may not understand the science behind it but one thing you can clearly know once it once it once it arrives you can you you, you know it's there that the wind is there it is it is like that with people who are born of the spirit you may not really understand how a person gets birthed in the spirit but when it happens you will you'll know it you will be able to hear it you will be able to feel it in your spirit so jesus is telling nicodemus you may not understand how this happens but you will be able to recognize it and nicodemus who is still puzzled he says in verse 9 how can this be and then jesus is a little frustrated with him because this man is supposed to be a a uh, pharisee he is a teacher of the word of god he is supposed to know the old testament almost by heart so jesus says to him in verse 10 you are a israel's teacher and do you not understand these things i very clearly told you born of the water and born of the spirit immediately you should have caught the verse that i'm referring to from the old testament a teacher like you should have understood the minute i said born of the water and born of the spirit you should have caught what i am saying how come you are not catching what i am saying and actually jesus over here is referring to ezekiel chapter 36 verses 25 to 28 so the minute jesus said born of the water and born of the spirit nicodemus should have caught it because he would have by hearted all those scriptures now we who do not know those old testament scriptures by heart it would help if we can actually read those verses so that we will know in what sense this term born of water and born of the spirit in what sense is it is it being used ezekiel 36 25 to 28 if someone could read out please ezekiel 36 25 to 28 then i will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my uh, judgments and do them. Then you will dwell in the land that I give to your fathers. You shall be my people. and i will be your god so jesus is reminding nicodemus of the scripture jesus is basically telling him you are thinking that you are already circumcised is it but no you see i have to put my spirit in you and move you 
then the, that circumcision will happen and it has not yet happened so in ezekiel 36 25 to 28 it talks about the cleansing by water it's a symbolic way of saying i will clean you from all your sinfulness and all your impurities and then the second thing that is told is that he will give a new heart and a new spirit because it will happen when the spirit is put inside the person once the spirit is put inside the person the person receives a new heart and a new spirit and then they will feel moved inside them to follow his commands to keep his decrees they will feel like following him they will feel like obeying him so um, jesus is saying you need this experience nicodemus you have not yet had it but you require it and uh, so you know uh, keeping these things in in mind jesus goes on to say in verse 11 very truly again he's using this you know highlight bold thing very truly i tell you we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen but still you people do not accept our testimony what is jesus talking about over here he's talking about how john the baptist has been going around every day from the moment john the baptist you know uh, recognized that jesus is the messiah he's been happily going around telling everyone this is the lamb of god he's been explaining things to them but the people are not listening in the same way uh, jesus goes on to say uh, later on that the father is also testifying of him but the people are not listening so jesus says very truly i tell you we speak we as in john the baptist and the father and jesus himself we are telling you what you require but you guys are not listening so that word you which is used over there that's the plural you it's not singular so jesus is not just attacking nicodemus alone is basically talking to nicodemus and all the pharisees and all these people who call themselves leaders and spiritual teachers but are unable to grasp these basic foundational truths so he's saying you people are not accepting what we are saying and then he says i have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe how then will you believe if i speak of heavenly things these are basic foundational things of everyday life which i'm telling you so you need to believe and accept this is what jesus says to um, nicodemus and basically to the entire you know pharisaic community and the sadducees and the other all the other learned people so now he repeats once again in verse 13 and he says no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven the son of man and then he says in verse 15 that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him so i am the only one who has ever been with the father literally seen him been with him and i am telling you that if you believe in me only then you will have eternal life so you need to believe these things which i am telling you nicodemus is what jesus is saying to him um and then in this portion jesus compares himself to the snake the bronze serpent which moses had you know made in the wilderness um if you were to you know re recollect that story uh, the people were uh, grumbling against god instead of being grateful they were grumbling and so at that time god sends poisonous snakes into the camp and people begin to die left and right and so at that time moses uh, is told to make a bronze serpent to lift it up and keep it high on a pole and so anyone who looks at that bronze serpent uh, will live because the punishment which should come upon them will instead be put upon the bronze serpent and the bronze serpent will become a curse it will become cursed so the curse will come upon the bronze serpent and not on the people so jesus says in the same way i too will be lifted up and here he refers to himself as the son of man now this is something that we talked about when we were uh, covering john chapter 1 in john chapter 1 when jesus was talking to nathaniel 
he's he refers to himself as the son of man and that was a reference from the book of daniel daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 where the messiah is described as the son of man who will one day come to judge the world so he will come down from heaven and he will judge the world as its ruler on that day so here jesus is saying i am that son of man but right now i have not come to judge i have come to save just like the bronze serpent i am going to be lifted up and the curse will come upon me upon my head i have come to do that so believe in me now while you still have a chance because the next time when i come the next time when the son of man comes there's only going to be judgment so um here in a few brief sentences john is under the inspiration of the holy spirit he's summarizing the conversation the detailed conversation which nicodemus and jesus would have had you know it's not possible to record every single word and phrase which they both exchanged uh, so just the main points are being summarized and brought out you know in this recorded conversation of course jesus would have explained all the details um when the actual conversation was going on but here we are given just the important highlights so that the reader will be blessed by these words and the reader will be willing to place his belief in this son of man who is willing to become a curse for him so um so jesus says that now this first time when the son of man has come he's not come to judge he's basically come to be lifted up to be crucified on behalf of the people so he explains that this is the level of god's love that he was willing to not just send the son of man as the judge and as the destroyer but first he wanted to give people a chance so the first time the son of man comes he doesn't come as judge and destroyer he comes as savior he the holy one comes to become a curse on our behalf i mean we are the cursed ones we are the ones who should have the punishment but he comes to become the curse for us so that is the level of his love why did god do this for god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever doesn't matter who that person is how rotten he is whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life now this would have been a bit shocking for nicodemus because nicodemus and the pharisees they considered themselves as the people of god the children of god the descendants of abraham we are not like the other nations we are the descendants of the chosen man of god abraham we are his descendants but now jesus is saying whoever doesn't matter which nation you're from doesn't matter who your forefather is if you believe in the son of man who is going to be lifted up then you will be saved that would have been a bit shocking for um, nicodemus that this offer of uh, the kingdom uh, citizenship is not just being given to the israelites is being opened up for everyone anyone who believes in him will have eternal life and will not perish because the Jews used to boast, ah, the whole world is going to hell. We will go get into the kingdom of God. We will sit at the, uh, the supper table of God. That was their belief. And Jesus is correcting that and saying, anyone, whoever believes in me, they will be saved. They will not perish. And uh, so over there, it talks about the love of God, which was so great that he gave his one and only son. And this verse is used by the Muslim critics sometimes uh, to create arguments and create strife. Uh, because in the NKJV, it does not say one and only son. It says only begotten son. And that creates a lot of problems uh, for us. Because they say, ah, see, here there's proof over here that uh, God, just like all the other uh, gods of the pagan nations he too had a consort he too had a wife and he slept with that woman and he gave birth to a son 
So you see, your God is just like all the other gods of all the other nations, is what the critics would say. Um, which is why NIV and most of the versions nowadays are careful to use the, act, the actual wording, the actual Greek wording, which is one and only son, not begotten. As in you, God did not give birth to him. Uh, so um, if at all any, any of us has to, you know, um, give an argument uh, when such a thing, when, when this topic is raised, it would be good for us to know a little bit of details. So this is not necessary for you to know for your salvation. I'm just providing a little bit of clarification so that if someone comes to you and mockingly says, ah, this Yahweh, he too had a consort just like all the other pagan gods. And yeah, he too slept with uh, somebody and gave birth to Jesus. If they come up with arguments like that, you will be able to clarify and explain to them the actual Greek wording over there. So if you were to look at the actual Greek wording, uh, this is what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his monogene son. M-O-N-O-G-E-N-E. -E. That is the Greek word over there. He gave his monogene son. That word monogene is translated by NKJV as begotten, but it is translated by other versions as one and only. So that word monogene is translated differently by NKJV and differently by NIV and the others. Why this confusion? What was the problem? The theme which originally you know, um, uh, translated uh, the NKJV version, they believe that this word monogene has been derived from the root word um, genao, G-E-N-N-A-O. They believe that the root word is genao, and from that word, this word monogene came. And genao basically means to give birth to. So therefore, in the NKJV, it is translated as begotten son. If monogene has derived from the Greek root word genao, which means to give birth to. However, many of the other translation uh, many of the other versions english versions they say no 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 the, the root word was not chennao the root word was something else the root word was um where do i have it written down it was um genos g e n o s so niv and many other versions will say that the root word was genos g-e-n-o-s and from that word the word monogene came and genos does not mean give, give birth to genos basically means something of a very specific class or type those who are science students will be familiar with this term genus a particular species a particular category a particular type that is basically that, uh, that word genus so that is the Greek word. So over there, it's basically saying that he's one particular type of son, one particular category of son, one particular species, a unique type of son. It's not talking about his begottenness because nobody gave birth to him. Rather, it is talking about his uniqueness. He's one particular type. So who is correct? Was the root word genos? which refers to a specific type or category, or is the root word genao, which is to give birth to. In their defense, NIV and the other versions, they will say, let if monogene was derived from genao, it would have had two ends. You know, they go through a detailed grammatical explanation to explain this. We will not get into all of that uh, for the simple reason that even I do not understand it. The simple layman's version is this. At the end of the whole story, if the root word was genao, then monogene would have to have two ends. But if you look at monogene in the Greek Bible, there is only one N over there. So it's more likely that monogene was derived from the root word genos. The word genos has got only one N in it. Monogene also has got only one N in it. One N in it. So the root word must be 
most likely it is genos which basically means that he's one particular type of son a unique son there is no other son like him so it's only talking about son in that sense of relationship it's not talking about god giving birth to anyone that is simply not the sense in which the term is used so just to avoid this whole argument and debate niv and many of the other versions they have they prefer to use the um, genos meaning that he gave that god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son a unique son like no other he gave him to the world so that anyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life okay so nowhere in the bible does it say that jesus was given birth to jesus was not born in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god he was not given birth to by anyone jesus was always there uh, okay so um yes now uh, maybe we can uh, have someone read out for us uh, verses 17 to 21 yeah verses 17 to 21 for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the holy begotten son of god and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone practicing evil hates and hates the light and does not come to the light lest the lest his deeds should be exposed but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in god here it's talking about two categories of people those who believe in the son of man and then those who do not believe in the son of man and what kind of a belief is it's talking about it's not talking about intellectual awareness of this jesus it's talking about a relational believing uh because uh you know if um if we could actually have someone read out for us james james chapter 2 verses 19 and 20 james chapter 2 verses 19 and 20 james 2 19 and 20 20 you believe that there is one god you do well even the demons believe and tremble but do you do you want to know oh foolish man that faith without work is dead faith without works is dead even the demons believe in god they believe in his existence they believe in in in, in the truth of his being there but they but they're believing has not done them any good they're all going to go to hell because just intellectual believing is not going to save a person so here in this were in, in john 316 when it says believe in him it's not talking about an intellectual belief even the demons believe that he is uh, the jesus is the messiah they have no doubt about it in fact they they know it so well that it makes them tremble the believing that here it's talking about in these verses is a relational believing where you believe in the person so much that you're willing to trust them and obey them no matter what they ask you to do so it's talking about that kind of a trust relationship that kind of a believing that doesn't require just intellectual believing it also requires action where you trust that person so much and believe in that person so much that you're willing to do anything that the person asks so god sent his son into the world so that people can believe in him in that way in that very personal way where they are willing to give up their past and say okay from now on i believe in you so much i will do what you are asking me to do i will not live my way i will start living your way because i trust you that much so it's talking about that kind of a believing so there will there will be people who will be willing to believe in jesus in that way and there will be people who will not 
be willing to trust Jesus in that way because they would have to give up their sins and they are not ready to do that. And such people will continue to hide in the darkness even though God has come to them. You know, so um, here it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. He sent the son of man with good intentions, not to judge and destroy, but to save them. And they need to respond positively to him. Um, so uh, just you know, to focus on that whole aspect of God sending the son into the world, not to condemn, but to save. We have a uh, reference to that in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. So if someone could actually read out that, Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. Nine, 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a dog. 10. I will, I will cast out, I will ca cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So, if people hear that God is sending his holy son into the world, it's a scary thing. Because what have they been doing? Have they been living in a way which honors God? No, they've been living in rebellion against God. So the first thought will be, is he sending his son to destroy us, finish us up? But here, God says, no, 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 he's not sending the son to destroy. He's sending the son to save. And that is what is talked about in Zechariah 9, 9 to 10. Over there, daughter Zion is told, Jerusalem is told, don't be scared, rejoice, because your king is not coming on a war horse to destroy you. Rather, he's coming peacefully on a donkey. A donkey is not a, uh, not a uh, animal of war. It's an animal of peace. So, in fact, uh, God says, I will cut off the war horse from Jerusalem. So, when he comes to you, when the king comes to you, he will not come on a war horse. Rather, he will come riding on a donkey, proclaiming peace to the nations. So God should actually send his son to punish you guys for the way you've been living in rebellion. But rather than sending you to sending him to punish you, he's sending him to become a curse for you, to save you. That is the level of this. God's love is what um, you know, um, Jesus is trying to bring out over here in these verses. So because he's coming with so much love and with good intentions, Therefore, people should be eager to welcome him. But many people don't eagerly welcome him. Why? That is because light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Jesus came as the light. He came to, to light up dark lives, to be able to give us hope, uh, to save us to restore us, to redeem the things which are broken. He came with all good intentions. But the problem is, he is light. Once you go near him, all the dirt will be exposed automatically. So people who prefer to continue doing the bad, dirty things don't want to come into his presence because once, he come, once they come into his presence, their dirt will be exposed. But they love the dirt. They want to continue living in it. So that is why they choose to stay away from him and not trust him. And then it says over here, that's why it, 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 it So Jesus explains in verse 20, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. On the other hand, those who have a heart for the things of God they know that they are not perfect, 
So they will humbly come into his presence. They will admit their sinfulness. They will confess. They will repent. And then the Lord will just forgive them. Because they, even though they have been sinning, they don't enjoy their sinfulness. They long for a change. So we'll reflect upon this further when we come back from our break. Thank you.